Hello, everyone. Um, happy Wednesday. Um, thank you so much for the people who have are here joining. Um, this is recorded, so if you love it, you can just continue to watch it over and over again uh, or tell your friends about it. Um, they can access it through our, our website. Um, so during the talk, um, obviously, if you have questions that come up, um, feel free to type it into the Q&A. Um, and at the end, I'll uh, do my best to leave a few minutes uh, in order to address those questions um, that might come up as we review this. So tonight, we're going to talk about um, the the old, the good old uh, adnexal mass. Um, obviously, this is there are a lot of different things that can be down in the adnexa, um, and we're going to focus more on, you know, distinguishing benign versus malignant, which is, you know, the biggest challenge that we have when it comes to uh, those ultrasound reports and the patients that we, we see in the office. Um, I have no disclosures. Uh, and so tonight, the learning objectives are going to be to sort of understand exactly the challenge that evaluating an adnexal mass poses, uh, understand the strengths and limitations of the, of the modalities available to characterize an, uh, to characterize an adnexal mass, um, and review some of the models um, for evaluating and managing um, an adnexal mass. So I always like starting with real life. These are real patients. I didn't just make them up. Um, these were people who, uh, the names have been changed obviously, but these are people who um, I've seen um, through uh, throughout the years. So this first patient, and I want you to, as I go through this, we're just gonna fly through these three quick cases. You're gonna sort of in your head, answer the questions that I'm asking you and then you know, kind of try to remember. So at the end of the talk, we're gonna kind of go back and use some of the tools that we talked about today and, and see what we think and see how well those tools um, work for, for these patients. So Eunice is a 52 year old. She um, presented to the GYN office to get her IUD that had, you know, been in there for probably 20 years removed. Uh, they went to go remove it and the strings broke. Um, and uh, also said, oh yeah, and by the way, I've been having some postmenopausal bleeding, which was thought to be due to this IUD. So her history is notable for uh, an early menopause at, at 44. She has a personal history of stage 2B breast cancer. Um, BRCA was ordered because she was young when she got it, um, but uh, denied by her insurance. She was done with treatment um, and currently was without evidence of disease, um, had undergone a mastectomy. She had a mother with maybe uterine, maybe cervical cancer, unclear. Um, and on physical exam, especially the pelvic exam, uh, there was limited mobility of the uterus the le there, and a, a left adnexal mass with some some nodularity uh, and some tenderness was appreciated. And so, you know, at this point you're asking yourself, okay, you feel this, it's not normal, your IUD strings broke, what, what's gonna be the thing? And we all know we're probably gonna go with uh, an ultrasound, but we have options. We could get a CAT scan, an MRI, or maybe not, maybe some of you would say, ah, oh, forget it. Well, that IUD can just stay in, but but I doubt it. So so most of you, as as I would I would think, will will opt for the pelvic ultrasound. So she got a pelvic ultrasound and you open up the pictures and this is what you see. Uh, and you're sort of squinting and it doesn't look like a whole lot. And you're kind of wondering. So you start scrolling through and you're like, oh yeah, there's there's something there. Oh, uh, but it, you know, again, hard to tell. What am I looking at? Is this the uterus is, you know, sideways. Um, and you look and there's maybe some shadowing, um, but it's, so you're gonna go to the report because you can't really make out what exactly they're looking at. And, and they describe a solid lesion um, in the left adenexa. They say that there's probably a distended fallopian tube with some echoes and they think it's a hematocelphinx. Uh, and they say, well, and you know what? And it might've been there for, all for a while, like way back to 2011, we think maybe it was there. So, so we think maybe it's a fibroid or maybe it's a fibrothricoma, but it also could be any neoplasm. 
and you see that word and you're like, well, how, you know, because now the neoplasm means anything that can grow on the ovary that shouldn't, benign or malignant. And so, but the first two don't sound too scary. And uh, and so then they say, but maybe you should get a pelvic MRI. And so you're sitting there wondering, well, what do I do with this patient? Where do I go? Do I do get the MRI? Do I not? Do I refer? Do I not? Um, and this is this is something that you know that you see. So maybe some of you say, oh yeah, the radiologist is like you get. I should get an MRI. I'm gonna get an MRI. And it's not just because the radiologists want to stay in business. It's because you know they're gonna, this is gonna help me to decide what to do uh, with this patient. And so you get an MRI and the MRI says, uh, there's a mass in the fallopian tube um, and the left ovary looks normal uh, and she's got some fibroids and there's a little bit of fluid, a moderate amount of fluid, which is probably a little bit more than there should be uh, in, the, in the uterine cavity, which maybe, maybe talks about, maybe is uh, the why she's been having bleeding, but maybe it's because that IUD has been sitting in there for too long. So so now you have a choice to do, you know, do you for refer now? Do you, there's no more imaging to do. You can get some blood work, tumor markers. There's a list of about 20 different ones. Which tumor markers do you get? Which ones are appropriate? Do you just order them all and hope that something points to the right direction and what to do? And so you, you know, you know about the CA-125, so you get that and it's elevated at 248. And so now your options are, well, uh, repeat imaging, see if it grows, see if it changes. Probably none of you would do that. Uh, refer to Gynoc, which is probably, you're all going, yes, yep, that sounds good. Refer to general surgery, hopefully not, uh, or find a desk to hide under. You might choose two and four, um, but, uh, but hopefully you'll do two first. So that's the first case. Seems pretty straightforward. You got, you pretty much knew what to do with the help of uh, an MRI and uh, a CA-125 and you're feeling good because you got this patient delivered to the right place. So the next is Jennifer. She's a 27 year old and she comes in and with a complaint of oligomenorrhea. Again, does it has a history of a C-section. She's obese with a BMI of 43, maybe some sleep apnea. Uh, family history of, you know, all the things that come with metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, but no family history of GYN or breast cancers. Uh, and again, you go to um, feel and she's obese and you're not quite sure what you feel, but maybe there's something there uh, and maybe there's some fullness, uh, but you really can't feel because your exam is, is super limited. So now what would you do? Well, some would say, well, maybe I feel something, but I can't feel. And so since I can't feel, maybe I should get an ultrasound to try to figure that out. So you get the ultrasound and you pull up the picture and you say, oh, well, that kind of looks like a normal ovary. There's some, uh, there's some follicles there and they're putting, we're not sure what they're measuring, but then you kind of scroll and you see this in the right ovary and you say, think to yourself, well, that doesn't look like a follicle. That's starting to look a little bit abnormal. And now there's there's some red in the picture and I'm not quite sure what that means, but that can't be good. So you go down to the report and they say, there's a thick walled cyst in the right ovary demonstrating a peripheral component without vascularity. And then they tell you what they think this is. It could be a hemorrhagic corpus luteum. However, they recommend a follow-up in six weeks. And so this seems pretty well, she's 27. She ovulated, though she's telling me she didn't get a period. She hasn't gotten a period. And if she ovulated and had a corpus luteum, she should have a period, right? So it's not lining up. So maybe she gets some tumor markers. Uh, and so do you, do you not? She's 27, you're, uh, you're not quite sure what to do. Um, and then would you repeat the imaging? Do you do what radiology tells you? And so, some would do it, maybe some aren't too concerned with that ultrasound, but you decide to do it uh, because the radiologist told you to, and you know that you know physiologic things should hopefully get better and non-physiologic things will not. Um, and now it's very different. It got bigger. It now looks totally different than that picture that I showed you before. Um, and now they're talking about a complex cystic mass with internal septations and echogenetic, and now the red's going into the septation. So maybe that's more concerning. And this thing has gotten a lot bigger. 
Um, and they even say it's significantly increased in size in over just six weeks. So now you're sort of freaking out a little bit, right? Because you waited six weeks and what to do. So maybe now you're going to get the tumor markers. Um, and so you get them and they're 83. So you're sort of, okay, 27. I don't like the look of this. So your options again, offer surgery, repeat imaging, uh, find a desk to hide under or refer to G1 Ecology. Um, and then the last one, 92, sweet Madeline. So she comes in saying she's been having some lower abdominal pain, uh, which got better with helping out some constipation, but she feels gassier. She's had some nausea, vomiting. She hasn't seen a gynecologist in 50, since she was 50, uh, which we hear a lot. Um, uh, but really no, you know, pretty good for 92, has a little hyperlipidemia, a little hypertension, had some, had a mother with breast cancer at 49, uh, and maybe a maternal grandmother also, but she made it to 92 and doesn't have breast cancer. So that's probably pretty good. And, um, and you go to do your exam and she does not like it and it hurts. And she says, stop. Um, and you don't really feel, you're not sure what you feel and you're not sure what to do at this point. So now, obviously, you know, your GI symptoms, you don't know what you feel, it's down by the pelvis, you know, what do you do? Do you get a CAT scan, maybe, because she's got GI complaints? Do you do a pelvic MRI? Do you do an ultrasound? What is the, the best imaging in this, in this scenario? So we're gonna, because of the GI things, this time they got a CT scan. Okay, and this says bilateral adnexal solid and cystic masses, right greater than left, concerning for malignancy. There it is, right there in print. Now you, you got to refer, right? Because the radiologists have now put the word cancer on there. And she's 92, right? So you're thinking to yourself, it's going to be cancer uh, until proven otherwise. Uh, and then they even say, and there's small nodular areas in the peritoneum that are concerning for metastatic deposits. So radiology has made the diagnosis. They're setting you up. They're telling you, you know, this 492 year old, you're going to have to tell her she's got ovarian cancer. Uh, and then, you know, would you do anything more than just the CT scan at this point? So those are, those are things to uh, and so she does get an ultrasound. And again, they talk more, again, your bilateral adnexal solid and cystic, again, worrisome for a neoplastic process, which again, a lot of people see that and I immediately get the phone call. Uh, doesn't always mean cancer, just means it's not gonna resolve. Um, and they don't see normal ovaries. So now would you do any tumor markers? So you do, this time they add a CEA, because again, there was some bowel complaints. She had a normal CEA, but her CA-125 was mildly elevated, and, uh, and now you need to decide what to do. So needless to say, they all came, came to G1-UC. So those are cases, something to think about uh, while we're going through these slides. Um, and obviously, I'll tell you how it all ends at the end. Uh, so it keeps you logged on. Um, so the outline of today, we're going to talk about the problem. We'll talk about the triage tools that we have, uh, some emerging, not so emerging, uh, management strategies. Um, and then, you know, what is, what does ACOG say? What is What is the recommendations there? So the challenge is ovarian cancer is a devastating disease. It presents at an advanced stage with a high mortality. Um, and despite therapeutic advances, um, we still, uh, seven, over 75% of women will be diagnosed at stage three or four, uh, and over, overall survival has not really budged much um, uh, over the years. And, um, and partly that's because we have no effective screening strategies for this disease. Um, there's no such thing as catching it early. Um, and really at this point, the only thing we can offer patients is to identify those who are at a, you know, what we feel is a, a reasonable risk and offer them prophylactic surgery before over ovarian cancer happens. But often ovarian cancer happens in women where 
it was they were blindsided. There were no warnings. There were no risk factors. Um, and so that strategy obviously doesn't work for everyone either. So we think that the adnexal mass is the gateway to ovarian cancer. And so, you know, we're when we have a patient who has a mass on their ovary, the first thing they're going to want to know when you tell them there's something, is it cancer or is it something else? And so we know that it's important in figuring this out, um, not missing the cancer, getting those patients to where they need to be. And so there is well-documented studies that show that when um, women are operated on by GYN oncologists, their outcomes are better. They have uh, better surgical options, improved staging, better prognostic information, and improved survival. Um, and so despite we do really well in, in the city of Boston and in our geographic area, because uh, at every street corner, there's a G1 oncologist, but in other parts of the country, believe it or not, uh, referrals for ovarian cancer are in the 40 to 50% range to, to G1 oncologists. So it's, you know, it's important. We know it's important. And we also know that that generalists, right? That OBGYNs and internists are the ones who are identifying these patients. We're not, you know, at the street, we're not also at that street corner where the sign's saying, you know, you think you have ovarian cancer, come and see me. You guys are, are finding these patients and working them up and getting them to where they need to be. So, uh, you know, almost 300,000 women um, per year will get hospitalized for an adnexal mass. So it's it's a huge challenge, okay? Five to 10% of those women will undergo surgery. Um, and 22,000 cases of ovarian cancer are diagnosed every year. So that's, of all of these women, of these 300,000, it's a very small portion that will actually be cancer, okay? But again, we don't, we don't wanna miss it. So the burden of this daunting triage task is on the shoulders of the, of the practicing OBGYNs and internists who are seeing these patients and, and figuring out where to go. So when we look at you know, how many adnexal masses will be cancer, when we look retrospectively, these, um, the, they come up with about a 20% prevalence rate, which of course seems way too high. Um, and that's probably because these retrospective reviews are, are biased towards higher risk patients, things like that. And so when you sort of look at studies all altogether, um, again, 20% being malignant, 80% being benign. When we look more at population generalizable groups of, of, of women, we see that it's actually much lower, thank goodness. So it's not 20% and it's thought to be closer to about 6% and maybe even lower for premenopausal patients. So it's rare, right? Most, again, what I, the first thing I tell my patient who's coming to see me with that adnexal mass, and of course they're coming to the cancer doctor, so they probably have cancer. They've already probably, you know, made arrangements. The first thing I said to them is the most likely diagnosis for this adnexal mass is that it's benign, okay? Now, my prevalence isn't gonna be 6%, right? Because you guys filter those out and you don't let me see those. So my prevalence is of course gonna be a lot higher. Um, and But still, even in my population, so maybe I'm more towards the 20 or 30%, I still benign, borderline non-malignant diagnoses are more likely than cancer. Uh, and they enjoy hearing that when I start off my consult with them. Uh, I think I see their blood pressure literally go down as, as they walk in. So as you all know, you know what can be in the adnexa? Well, there, um, there are a lot of things that grow in the ovary. There are benign follicular cysts or what we call physiologic cysts. And then there are neoplasms, which are you know typically cyst adenomas if they're simple, which you know come in different forms, serous, mucinous, and endometrioid. There's non-gynecologic things that you can kind of see over there. Is it something off of the GI tract? You've got the colon, you've got the bladder. Um, uh, when we go into complex cysts, um, which means you know septations or cystic and solid components. 
Now our differential, our list gets even longer, um, both benign, malignant, um, uh, metastatic lesions, cancer from somewhere else that ended up on the ovary. Uh, in terms of the cancers, you know, all the different layers of the ovary, you've got the epithelium, which make our epithelial primary ovarian cancers the germ cells, germ cell tumors, the, the glue of the ovary, which make the stromal or sex core tumor. So it's, it's huge, the list goes on and on. And so, you know, obviously, while you might say to a patient, yeah, this could be a granulosa cell tumor, which, you know, my ICD code says this is cancer, that's gonna be a very different prognosis, a very different, and when they're Googling ovarian cancer, they're reading about a totally different disease. So this is really, you know, again, it's a, it's a, it's a tough and a, cha a tough challenge um, for, for all of us um, before surgery. Once we've got the path report, then, you know, it is what it is. But, but beforehand, getting these patients to where they need to go is, it, it can be tough. Um, so again, common problem, the adnexal mass. Cancer is always possible, but very, you know, but rare majority are going to be benign. And we know getting these patients to the right doctor is important. So in a perfect world, we would have a patient who has a mass. We have we order a test. It tells us benign or cancer. And then we get it to the right doctor, right? Wouldn't that be nice? And you know, I was thinking as I was preparing this talk, our surgical colleagues, this is what they do. You know, there's a mass in the pelvis and it's not attached to a GYN organ. They send them to radiology to stick a needle in it. So they always have a diagnosis before. Their, their consent forms don't have question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. They don't have to talk about the 30 different possibilities of what this thing could be because most of their things they can stick a needle in and get a diagnosis before they even think about bringing the patient to the operating room. And so we don't do that in over, right? We don't stick needles in ovaries or uteruses or GYN organs for uh, either bleeding reasons or the thought of contaminating or spilling or, you know, um, or also sampling error. You know, uh, a lot of even solid masses on the ovary, you are a heterogeneous mass, meaning what's over on the left side of the ovary might be different than what's over on the right side of the ovary. And so you might get falsely reassured by that. Uh, by that needle biopsy, whereas a, you know, a sarcoma growing in the retroperitoneum, it's a pretty uh, homogeneous mass and a needle, you know, they're going to get pretty good doc, uh, diagnostic information um, by doing that. So, so we have it tougher. All right. Don't ever think that you don't because you do. Um, so what do we have? What do we have in our our sort of toolbox in order to, to figure this out. Well, we have the good old history and physical exam, which should always be part of our evaluation. Um, we have ultrasound, which is, you know, again, probably what most of you will, will, will start with and order first, which is, which is the right thing to do. Then there are things like CT scans and MRIs, and PET CTs and tumor markers, and, uh, and then obviously, ultimately, pathology. And so again, when we talk about history, well, what's, you know, when someone calls me up and says, you know, hey, can I run a patient by you? And they're like, okay, so I saw this woman and she's got a seven centimeter, and I'll be like, stop, how old is she, right? Because uh, there's a huge difference between if this person with a mass on her ovary is 27 or this person with the mass on her ovary is 92. So age matters, menopausal status matters. Um, and again, there's data to suggest that the risk of malignancy obviously is very different between these two groups with, you know, premenopausal women, be the risk of malignancy being in this, hopefully in the single digits, whereas it can get up to the, you know, 20%, 45%, this seems a little high, but, you know, you've got a, you've got a mass on an ovary in, in a postmenopausal patient, this is where, and it, and it's new, meaning it grew in menopause. So that's the other thing that this might not account for is the mass that was there in the 40s and it's just still there. Um, and so obviously that is a lot of what we see as well, um, but age matters. And then of course, family history matters. So in ovarian cancer, only about five or 10% of women who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer will have a gene, right? This, that will have, a hereditary predisposition to them getting the rest of them. It was, you know, 
bad luck. Um, there are some risk factors, environmental risk factors, but it's the genes in their body that broke, not the genes they inherited. And so, um, but when we think about that, right? So that's when we, we do it backwards. When we think about it in the reverse, knowing a family history, right? There are a lot of women out there with probably BRCA genes, Lynch syndrome, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndromes who have not been genetically tested. And so asking about first degree relatives with breast or ovarian cancer, asking about colon cancers, this is all an important part when you're sort of filing your risk calculator in your, in your head. Um, and so, you know, the other thing is what are they, you know, what are they going to tell us? What do, what do we want to know when we're taking that history besides their age uh, and their family history? Well, we want to know, you know, is this symptomatic? And if it is, what are the symptoms? Because maybe ovarian cancer isn't too silent. And what some studies have shown is that most women who are diagnosed with uh, ovarian cancer will report uh, symptoms um, of bloating, increased abdominal girth, pelvic or abdominal pain, or difficulty eating and feeling full. And now the problem with women is they might report that once they know they have something there and they'll go, yeah, matter of fact, this has been going on for three years, right? But they never told anybody, but maybe if we asked, right? And so the problem is these are non-specific. And then the other challenge is they're often a sign of advanced disease, right? So again, the, the, this history isn't helping us um, to detect it any earlier and to find it earlier, but maybe it is helping us when, again, in our brain, we're trying to figure out what the risk that this adnexal mass is something is something bad and what we need to do about it. So physical exam is also another challenge, right? So we have the one patient, 92, hadn't had a pelvic exam in 50 years and vaginas stenotic and atrophic and it hurts and you don't feel much. And then obesity, right? Sometimes we can't feel anything in these patients where, um, you know, they're morbidly obese and you're trying to feel for an ovary or, and, you know, you're not, unless it's 20 centimeters, maybe you're not going to feel that. Um, but it still is important and it's really important in our postmenopausal patients, right? Because Premenopausal, oh, maybe it's a fibroid, maybe it's a, you know, maybe it's a physiologic cyst, but in the postmenopausal woman who, you know, you know, maybe she's been your patient forever, you know that there aren't fibroids there because every year you feel their uterus and it's always been small and now you're feeling something. Um, now, now that you're going to be a little more concerned. Um, but obviously, physical exam is not perfect. And things like the size of the mass, whether it moves around, where it is, is it way up in the abdomen because it's torsed, or is it way down in the pelvis? You know, and then, you know, the experience of the, the examiner. Um, so we often rely on, on ultrasound. Ultrasound is a great tool. Um, uh, most patients, we get good visualization of the ovaries. We can characterize, um, you know, solid components, cystic components. We can see if there's septations or blood flow. We can look for things like free fluid or even the presence of ascites. And so it's very good at detecting things like simple cysts or endometriomas and dermoids, which again are a large portion of our adnexal masses. Um, and so again, very good tool to use. And, and obviously I'm sure everyone here uh, uses it often. And so it performs well, uh, but you know, again, not always. Um, now, more recently, you may have started seeing on your, this ORADS, right? We all know about uh, mammography and the BIRADS. And, and so ORADS is um, radiologists attempt to simplify it. So here it is, so simple. This is, this is ORADS. And so, you know, basically what they're trying to do is tell us um, about that, they're trying to categorize and help the, the refer, you know, the, the doctor who ordered them to say, is this mask almost certainly benign? And therefore I can manage it as a generalist or 
you know, um, or is there a reasonable chance of malignancy that I should not operate and I really should be sending this patient to a specialist? And the thought is, is that if, you know, you've got this five point category. So you've got ORADS one, which is just the normal ovary. You've got ORADS two, which is, you know, things like simple cysts where this is thought to have a less than 1% risk of malignancy. This is where you have high reliability and what you're looking at and, and what they and what they feel. And so, uh, and then even low risk where you're still under 10%, you're maybe telling your patient, you know, there's a small chance that this is cancer, but 90%, or more, this is a benign mass. So you're gonna feel pretty pretty good um, with one or two, absolutely. You're, gonna, you're not even gonna mention this. You're not gonna put staging question marks on your, you're not gonna talk to it. Um, and then obviously four and five, that's that's good too. And then this, you know, this 10%, well, I don't wanna be, I don't, that means, you know, 10 of a hundred cases are gonna bring to the OR are gonna, one in 10 are gonna be, uh, are gonna be cancer. And I don't, I don't really like those odds and I don't know what to do. And so that's where they're saying, well, maybe this three is sort of in between. And that's where you're either going to get a second opinion on your ultrasound. You're going to talk to a specialist. Maybe then you shoot me an email and say, hey, take a look at this ultrasound. What do you think? You know, should I send it to you guys? Should I not? That's an appropriate time where you're either masking those questions or maybe getting you know, another imaging modality to sort of help to stratify, you know, your risk and, and to characterize this mass a little bit better. Um, and so, you know, this is well, uh, this is, this system has been um, uh, validated. It's, it's live. Um, it's just not being adopted, I think, as quickly as we think, but I think you're going to start seeing this more and more, um, definitely at the BI for sure. So then we have CT scan. So, you know, again, if you're at, you get this ultrasound, you're not quite sure when you're supposed to get a CT scan, when you're not. And so really what, when I think about CT scans, I'm not, you know, if I have a CT scan, someone, you know, an internist calls me and says, I, I have the CT scan and, and the woman has bilateral ovarian masses and definitely, you know, definitely her ovaries need to come out. The first thing I'm gonna do is, that, is not believe anything in a CT scan report says, because the ability to decipher solid over cystic versus complex, CT scan is not for that, right? CT scan can say, oh yeah, somewhere down near the ovaries, there's, if they look too big, right? So often you'll see reports where they'll say, prominent ovaries or, right? But they're not describing it because that's not what a CT scan is you know, unless it's really obvious, a CT scan isn't the best thing. So really what you're looking for is everything else, right? Is there lymphadenopathy? Is there parat is there anything above the belly button, right? Because maybe you've got this, the pelvic ultrasound or even an MRI, but those are pelvic, right? You're not looking. Is there, are you missing anything? You're looking at solid organs like the liver and the spleen and, um, and seeing, and that's really where the, where the, um, where the CT is. The other thing is, you know, CT scans are actually better than, probably better than MRI. I don't know, maybe a radiologist would, would, would disagree with me, but are pretty reliable in looking at things like stranding, right? Inflammation. And so, so your CT scan is going to be really helpful in the patient with fevers or, you know, not a fevers and an adnexal mass and, you, and you, um, you're worried about an abscess. Um, and so that's another place where a CT scan is going to be uh, is going to be helpful. Or maybe there's some bowel symptoms and you're worried about a diverticular abscess, which again can be an ovary problem, but it but it is a primarily colon problem. Um, and so that's that's sort of where we where we use it. Um, and you know when there's a reasonably high chance that. Um, uh, that this is ovarian cancer. Again, we're looking to see what the extent of disease is um, for, for usually surgical planning. And then the MRI. So I get this question a lot, right? So radiology tells me I should get an MRI. She's got a 30 centimeter mass on her ovary. And I'm like, yeah, no, it needs to come out, right? So uh, I have a better test than an MRI. It's called take it out and look at it under the microscope. So 
the times that I really think about MRI is when it's not clearly gynecologic. Like they think it's maybe an ovary, they think it's maybe a tube. So that first patient Eunice where they're talking about, you know, it could be a dilated tube and then there's a mass. They don't know what the mass is on, but she's got fibroids. So maybe the mass is a fibroid and you're not really sure what this is. And then all of a sudden you get an MRI and they're going to tell you, boom, she's got fibroids. She got a normal ovary and she's got a mass in her tube, right? You did not get that information from an ultrasound. That's really where your MRI helps you. Um, and so that's where I do it. The other place I do it is in my fertility patients who, you know, they're 27 years old. They got masses on both ovaries. I might use the MRI to help me. Do you see any normal ovary? Is there a plane? Can you, you know, really looking into the guts of the ovary and helping me to surgically plan um, is where I think that the MRI is, is the most helpful. Um, uh, again, it also can help with fat and blood and ascites and enhancing, right? So that's the other thing, dead versus not dead. Um, and so this is not a lecture on fibroids and ruling out leiomyosarcoma, um, but that's where when they look at in hand, they're talking about the enhancement. So you have to order an MRI with contrast in order to know whether something enhances. And so that is a very important part of the MRI report. Um, because that's telling us, is this, a, is this beast alive or is it dead? Um, and obviously, if it's alive, we're more worried about it if it enhances. And so you have to get it with, that, with contrast. Um, uh, you don't have to. You can get it without. And in pregnant women, we don't give them gallidium. So we don't have that. But we're missing that. So we don't get as much information um, on that pregnant patient MRI. And that's just something to think about when, uh, when, you're, ordering, when you're ordering MRIs. And PET CTs basically leave these up to the oncologist. There really is, I can't think of a scenario where a generalist, um, though interesting, I had a patient who's living out in San Francisco and she's thinking about flying to Boston to have her care here. And, um, and basically all of this was being, all of this workup was being done by her GYN, ordering bone scans because maybe there was bony lesions on her MRI. And she's telling me all this thing. And I'm thinking to myself, this poor generalist, like this isn't their job. <laughs> and, um, but she hadn't even gotten to an oncologist and already they were ordering all these, all these different tests, which I think are, you know, sort of maybe that's the way they do things there, um, but, but not here. So PET CT, why, when do I use it? I really, you know, for ovary things, um, it's not really uh, approved. Um, I may use it in the recurrent setting to sort of something post-surgical change versus, um, and so what PETS uh, does is it obviously detects increased cellular activity by, by linking um, the, the um, uh, FDG, which is the, the marker they use, tracing that and linking that to sugar. And so, you know, they'll have, patients have to have a certain diet because if they you know, the Fruit Loops right before a, a PET CT, they're going to light up like a Christmas tree. So um, PET CTs also, if you do them close to surgery, recent surgery, recent procedures, even something as simple as a cervical biopsy, and you're doing a PET CT for cervix cancer, it's going to show some avidity down in the cervix because you you induce trauma and you induce cellular activity by, by doing that. And it doesn't necessarily mean cancer or not. Um, and again, um, yes, studies will show if you get, if you put all these tests together, you're going to have better, uh, sensitivity and specificity when it comes to, uh, determining whether something is cancerous or not. But, um, that obviously is huge cost and not necessary. Uh, and obviously I don't, I don't know that I've ever been referred to a patient who's had, uh, an ultrasound, a CT, an MRI and a PET all done. Um, but maybe by the time they're done seeing me, they might. <laughs> so um, we're going to step away from imaging and we're going to look into some of the serum markers we have. Again, um, if you look at this, uh, this is some of the most common uh, markers that are associated with some ovarian malignancy. So, you know, you have a solid cystic mass, there are over 30 um, maybe they're starting to see something on the, even in the ultrasound, some free fluid, some things. So now you're starting to think epithelial ovarian cancers and what are the markers for these? 
This is where CA-125 comes into play, sometimes CEA and sometimes CA-199 to distinguish between you know, mucinous versus uh, serous type. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, again, postmenopausal solid ovarian mass, right? And so now you're starting to think of things like granulosa cells, Sertoli Lydig, fibroma thecoma on the benign side, fibroma is the most common thing. But what are the tumor markers you're going to think of? Well, you're never wrong to get a CA125, but you also may think about getting this because often CA125s are going to be totally normal in a granulosa cell tumor. And also, you know, in a patient, usually these are confined to the ovary. These are usually early stage, stage one. So you're not going to have peritoneal, you know, or free fluid, but you may have your patient who is starting to talk about bleeding patterns, right? And if they're premenopausal, heavier, prolonged bleeding, if they're postmenopausal, postmenopausal bleeding, you get an ultrasound to look at the stripe and lo and behold, there's a solid mass on the ovary. That's, you're starting to think about your granulosa cells. Or on physical exam, you see clitormegaly or hirsutism, things like that. You're gonna start thinking about um, maybe Sertoli Lydig cell tumors and, and getting things like testosterone um, or um, some of the other um, uh, androgen uh, androgens um, to try to figure out if that's, that's what you're looking at. Um, now what I often will see is, uh, and then is the 52 year old or the 56 year old and they've done germ cell markers. Um, and so 56 years old, you're not gonna have a germ cell cancer in your ovaries. So, so there, you really never should be getting, uh, you know, HCG unless you're worried she's pregnant. Um, an AFP or an LDH, which is deciphering between. But if you do have someone who's, uh, you know, premenarchal or in the second, even the third decade of life, right? So you're under 30 and you now have a mass, you're not wrong to look at germ cell markers. It's rare in your 20, in your 30s. But again, the germ cell patients I've had are never under 18 because we don't do pediatrics at BI. And I have, you know, taken care of a dozen or so throughout my career. And so we do see them and they're usually under 30. Um, and so that's really where you're thinking about doing those tumor markers. But again, look at the characteristics. Is this cystic? You're starting to think epithelial. Is it totally solid? You're thinking sex called stromal. And that's where, you know, these different tumor markers can come in. And then of course your CEA and your CA199 can absolutely be a prime marker of a primary ovarian problem, usually the CA-125 is elevated too. But again, there you're thinking about GI tumors. They, this is where maybe they're solid, Krukenberg tumors, they're bilateral. Um, and now you need to start asking questions like, when was your last colonoscopy? And what's your family history? And do you have any uh, upper GI symptoms? And uh, and things like that. And, and maybe here you're now thinking about a CAT scan when you see that these are elevated, um, even when there's something on the ovary. Um, oh, I was supposed to have those boxes go before I did all that. Sorry. <laughs> Hopefully you follow. Um, so again, CA-125, most investigated serum glycoprotein that we use in order to discriminate benign from malignant adnexals. It is not a screening test. Okay, it is also not diagnostic. We know that it works much better in advanced disease. So that 80 to 85% of patients with ovarian cancers will have elevated CA-125s, especially when they have stage three, two, three, four disease. But when you have a patient with early stage disease, your sensitivity is gonna drop way off. And so the first thing I always tell them is, you can have a benign mass and an elevated CA-125. You can have a normal CA-125 and cancer. So it is not diagnostic. It is not a diagnostic test. I think patients get confused about that. They think, oh my gosh, my CA-125 is elevated. I have cancer. Um, or the radiologist said I have cancer. Um, and, and I think what we all know is, you know, the only thing that diagnoses cancer is pathology. So it's good for planning 
um, operative therapy, uh, trying to define the extent of disease. Most importantly, it's good for monitoring ovarian cancer status. Um, you know, if we've gotten rid of the cancer, if we've gotten that patient in remission, that CA125 should normalize. If it starts to go up again, that's where we're worried about recurrence. And off, often CA125 is the first hallmark of disease recurrence. We always get a CAT scan when that CA125 rises and often we don't see anything, but it's the cancer's there and it's coming. And so it allows us to sort of, you know, prepare the patient for uh, what's, what's coming ahead. Um, you know, again, we keep trying to go back to some screening, using it with ultrasound, using it with different things as a screening tool. But to date, there has been no study that has confirmed that it is actually uh, an effective screening tool. Um, and again, there's so many reasons why CA125 is falsely elevated. And so that patient who comes in and says, my mom died of ovarian cancer, I want to CA125 every year, um, don't do it. <laughs> you will find yourself, refer that patient to genetics, right? Have her get information, get her risk stratified, and then tell her, you know what, it's reasonable, especially as if it's a first degree relative to consider removing your ovaries after, but not doing ultrasounds, not taking, doing CA-125s. Again, this is a different lecture all in itself, um, but that's not what CA-125 is for. We all know all of the benign reasons. Um, and, um, you know, I, uh, patient with pelvic pain, let's get in a, a CA-125 because the radiologist saw something on the ovary, which was probably an endometrioma. Uh, and now their CA-135 is through the roof. And so they've justified being able to send them to me. Uh, but I, again, there's a lot of damage control I have to do to tell them, you know, it is unlikely at 35 with dysmenorrhea and all the classic signs of endometriosis and adenomyosis that you have cancer. None of you do that, um, but it happens all the time. And then of course, non almost, I would say two to three times a year, I get the cirrhotic liver cirrhosis, belly full of ascites, that's it. They tap them, the ascites, there's no cancer cells, but the CA-125 is 300. So we're sure they have, and no, liver disease will elevate your CA-125. And it is, so will heart failure. So will lung disease. So there's lots of reasons for the CA-125 in patients with multiple comorbidities. And so unless there is something on the ovary, a mass on the ovary, a CA-125 should not be ordered because the patient has weight loss or, you know, uh, ascites with no ovarian mass. Um, a CA-125 is not the right diagnostic test. A paracentesis is the right diagnostic test. So some of you may have seen HE4 reports, especially if your patients are coming from the Rhode Island area. This was a, a, a marker that was sort of coming onto the scenes uh, probably in the uh, early 2000s um, and got a lot of uh, sort of excitement because it was thought to be able to discriminate better than the CA-125 between um, uh, benign disease, things like adenomyosis and endometriosis, which might fall, elevate your CA-125. Um, uh, and then maybe if you use them together, you're going to get some more diagnostic information. Um, and so that's really, you know, that really didn't pan out much. And so we don't see that as much. We've talked about CA, CEA and CA199. Again, big mucinous ovarian masses often will have an elevation, but it's a more commonly uh, test for, for pancreatic cancer, upper GI cancers. Um, and then again, some of you have probably seen um, or have had a rep come and tell you why these these assays where they're putting all of these you know proteins together to to try and tell people that you know it's better than CA125. You'll be able to reassure your patients. You can it will give you better prognostic information. And and here's our here's our study to prove it. You know our sensitivity, our specificity at all stages was much better when we used it. Um, when we use this multivariate, um, almost to a hundred percent, you know, that's really good. Oh my gosh, you have a test. It's a hundred percent proof. Um, look compared to the CA-125, um, but word of caution, 
um, the incidence of cancer was 30% in this trial. So we know that that's not the true incidence of, of ovarian cancer, and therefore their numbers are going to look a lot better, right? They're, they're screening for a much, much higher risk. Um, and so really, uh, your, your numbers are more fall in line with what you get out of CA-125. And so probably it's an expensive test that isn't perfect for everyone, but maybe in a resource restricted area, it's a little bit more helpful. And again, there are other tests, the, the Roma test or the risk of ovarian malignancy algorithm, which is a you know app on your phone and you can plug in your CA-125 and your HE4 values and it's gonna tell you a, a score and it also bases it on menopausal status. Um, and so again, all of these are good but not perfect. And then what we have, and then of course, we get down to now management trial. How, okay, so I have, I've gotten the imaging, I've done my physical exam, I've got my tumor markers, and I, you know, my gut tells me, you know, Dr. Garrett says a lot of these are going to be benign, so maybe they're not. Well, is there a calculator? Can I plug it in and, and decide, especially again, because it's going to be a two-hour drive for the patient to come see the, and she really wants to stay I in Provincetown and on the Cape to have her surgery. So maybe this is where, you know, the generalist who doesn't have a, a, a G1 oncologist at every street corner is going to start to plug this in and use these calculators. And, and of course they say, well, if your calculations come at a certain score, then send those patients to, to the specialist. Otherwise it's reasonable to, to take them to the OR yourself. And so the, the the risk of malignancy index has probably been around the, the most, it's the longest. Again, you're looking at ultrasound characteristics. Is there multilocularity, solid areas? Are they bilateral? Are there things like ascites and abdominal mats, which are all going to get you a point? You're going to then use that with the, with the number of CA-125, so the actual number. Um, and then menopausal, obviously much higher score for if you're post versus pre um, and you have a cutoff here. And this has been validated as a, as a reasonable triage tool to decide which is reasonable for you as a generalist to take and which should go to, go to the specialist. Um, more commonly, the, um, I was actually, the residents started talking about this and I was like, I don't even know what they're talking about. So I learned about it, the ADMEX risk model. So this is really a model that was developed by um, clinicians in uh, this IOTA group, which is an international group. Um, and so it was validated from uh, centers in Italy and Belgium and Sweden. And so up to date, we'll tell you all about it, but it really hasn't you know, caught on here per se. Um, again, this is using three clinical and six ultrasound predictors to try and come up with a with a risk score to again decide which which patients should be referred and which and which should. Um, and so then, what does you know what are our society say? So ACOG in um, collaboration with with our society of G1 oncologists, they basically said, okay, if you have a woman who is less than 50, her CA-125 is over 200, right? So you have a much higher threshold for younger women to weed out those benign causes of elevation. Anybody with ascites, anyone where there's any evidence of distant mats on any imaging, or if they have a significant family history. So all of these, any one of these, you don't have to have two out of three. So any one of these you would refer to G1 Oncology. This one says if they're, um, uh, oh, this is wrong. This should say postmenopausal. <laughs> if postmenopausal, their CA-125 is elevated at all, again, any of the obvious stuff. And so um, this was rewritten um, uh, where they, in 2011 was the last time they revised this and they took out these numbers. Um, so the 200 and the, and the, obviously they kept 35, but what they say is very elevated um, and they let you decide what that number is gonna be. So when, um, you know, in general, when are you operating on patients? When are you observing? When are you referring? When are you not? So that's, that's really what we need to decide. So, you know, I think the obvious stuff you have 
patient with a high ORADS 5, they've got metastatic disease, this patient's going to G1 oncology and most likely is going to the OR. Um, same thing if you're postmenopausal and you have an elevated CA125, you have a mass, even the simple that it gets greater than 10 centimeters. Now you really need to look at that cis lining to determine benign versus borderline versus, you know, malignant. Um, and then anything that's between five and 10, which is going to be a lot of stuff with, with symptoms. Those are, those are kind of slam dunk. Don't, there's no gray. These patients should, your recommendation is go to the operating room. Um, uh, again, any mass that is solid, we typically say, you know, it's, there's no way of knowing a fibroma versus a granulosa or a Sertoliolidix cell tumor. Um, and that any, uh, and, and obviously germ cell, this is really where you need paths. So anything that's solid usually typically goes to the operating room. It doesn't mean it needs to go to the operating room with a G1 oncologist, but should go to the operating room. Um, and then again, that intermediate group as well with risk factors. So when can we watch these patients? When can we say, hey, you know what? You don't have to go to the operating room. It's reasonable to do ultrasound. Um, so simple cysts less than 10 centimeters, right? You know, you can offer surgery, but if the patient is asymptomatic, it was an incidental finding, it is okay. Um, and also if there's compelling reasons, right? High risk, a lot of these patients are sick. It's, you know, they've had multiple abdominal surgeries. It's a high risk. And now your, you know, your risk benefit uh, uh, ratio is, is starting to change towards the, I like the idea of ultrasound. And then there's patient preference, you know? I, I will say to patients, what keeps you up at night? Does not knowing what this is for certainty keep you up at night? Or does the, uh, the, the, potential of having to undergo GA and surgery keep you up at night. And, and that's really where the decision should be. And sometimes they say they both do. And then you have to, you know, decide what you think is the right thing for the patient. But if you decide to watch, the one thing is, why are you watching? So why are you watching is to see, does it develop risks that are concerning for malignancy? Does it grow? Does it change? Um, and so this is when you're going to say, okay, we're stop watching. It's growing. It's already, that's one of my criteria is to stop watching and refer you to surgery. Um, and so setting that up, that expectation up at front, um, is important. So patients aren't like, oh, uh, you know, let's just get another ultrasound. So I'm going to conclude um, by going back to these cases, because I know you're all on your edge of your seat and dying to know, but so let's go back to Eunice. This is the one with the fallopian tube, and she had a history of breast cancer, postmenopausal. Um, and so if we look at our risk of malignancy index, um, very high. Remember, over 200 was, we're worried. Um, and then if we look at our ACOG and SGO guidelines, we look at the postmenopausal category again. She already had two of the three, so she's definitely going to G1 oncology, and we're, we're worried about what this is. Um, uh, and lo and behold, she had a malignant uh, cancer of her fallopian tube, um, uh, and also BRCA gene mutation. Um, that you know, again, had we tested back in her with her diagnosis of breast cancer, we perhaps would have caught this. Um, you know, or prevented this. And she ended up dying of her, of her fallopian tube cancer. Um, Jennifer, so Jennifer was the 27 year old, looked like a hemorrhagic cyst. She was obese, oligomenorrheic. You got a six week ultrasound and it had drastically increased in size and didn't look so good. And uh, they were worried about a neoplasm. So you had a mildly elevated CA125. So you put in your risk of malignancy index and you're, you're now above 200. Um, but then we go to our, maybe we didn't do this. We looked to, to our, our societies. And so not over 200. I wouldn't say that 83 is very high for a CA 125. No family history, no. So you could maybe make an argument here that you're going to take this patient to the operating room. Um, and she had a dermoid. Right. So, right. You know, you would have been OK had you followed this. I'm not saying this is better than that one, but I'm just saying this is where, you know, sometimes it's impossible. Um, uh, and honestly, uh, this was one of those things where ultrasound supposed to be able to reliably tell you when it's a dermoid. And this was not one of those cases. But luckily for her, it was and she's fine. 
And then Madeline, the 92 year old where radiology had her, you know, with stage four cancer and uh, she had bilateral masses, maybe peritoneal deposits. Your CA-135 was mildly, but her age alone and all of the things they saw in imaging gives her a 500. I mean, almost convincing this is a high risk of malignancy here. You look at your, um, your guidelines, they say it. Um, she had bilateral serous cystadenofibromas, uh, and they, she did not have uh, met, she did not have peritoneal deposits. There wasn't anything there, um, and uh, and Madeline got her ovaries out and did just well at ninety two. So uh, again, this is where um, this is again where uh, or there were fibromas, but. You know, th th this is tough. This is the challenge right here. And so I think the take home, I wish I could be more optimistic, but the take home is, again, most are benign. Age and menopause status matters. Maintain a high level of suspicion. And in a place like Boston, where there's a G1 oncologist at every corner, don't be afraid to refer. Um, you, This is, you know, we're, we're a team. We're here. If in doubt, shoot an email, have me take a look at ultrasounds. Um, we are here to help. Um, this is a, you know, it's not an easy task. We don't want to over refer and cause a lot of alarm, but we don't want to under refer and, uh, and, and put a patient through two surgeries or potentially a worsening outcome. Um, and so with that, I thank you. Uh, this is a picture that uh, I was home taking call, but they were down um, uh, in Newport at our, our annual regional conference. This is our first fellow, Caitlin. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Weishert is the, Weishert is the new uh, Drew uh, who has joined us from Leahy. He's our newest addition. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Esselin, uh, Dr. Dalrymple, who is uh, helps uh, guide us and mentor us, and uh, is has a large role over at the medical center, so doesn't see patients, but is also here to answer any clinical questions via email. And then Dr. Gettino, um, who uh, yeah trained at MD Anderson and grew up in New York City and uh, joined us a, a few years ago. So. Um, with that, it looks like there's one question on the Q and A, uh, and no, it's not even a question. It just says good job. So, um, if you have any questions, I'll stick around. Uh, there's, you know, a couple moments to answer, but, um, you know, I hope you learned something. I hope this was helpful. Um, and I wish this was in person, but, uh, always, always happy to help and feel free at any point to, to reach out and um, uh, if I can help. I was, I was making, I was telling uh, Kelsey who helps organize these talks for, for us and for MFM that I've, I've had this talk uh, in various forms, and I never get through all the slides. <laughs> so I'm, I'm impressed with myself that if without interruptions. Um, okay, so there is a question. When is surgical staging indicated in ovarian cancer? So that's a great, a great question. So surgery in general for ovarian cancer is, is sort of two categories. So there's surgical staging, um, which is what I did yesterday. So I went in, there was an adnexal mass, but the rest of her abdomen looked completely normal. There was no other abnormalities except for this large mass on the ovary. I got the ovary out, sent it to frozen section, and frozen section says, this is a carcinoma, and we, we believe it's an ovarian carcinoma. And so that's where the scenario where surgical staging is indicated. So that patient then went through removal of her uterus, her other tube and ovary. She was premenopausal. She underwent an omentectomy and she underwent um, systematic lymphadenectomy. So removal of her pelvic and periodic lymph nodes. Now, my hope is that everything I took out except for this large ovarian mass is going to be benign. But then I can tell her that she has stage one disease. Right. And what we know is that unless we do that, we're not accurately staging this women. 
that even though their CT scan might have shown no lymphadenopathy, there is a chance that under the microscope, we might see disease in our omentum, or we might see uh, occult disease in, in a lymph node. And now she's stage three, right? Which has a very different prognosis, a very different, you know, they may be a candidate for maintenance chemotherapies. It's gonna change how we treat them. And, and again, their, their prognosis and their survival. So that's where, where we're staging. A lot of times what we're doing in ovarian cancer is what we're, we're, called, we're debulking, okay? Or we're cytoreducing. And so that is where you have a CT scan and they have an omental cake, they have ascites, they have disease that is you know, diffuse. We know that you know, we don't have to take out their lymph nodes to prove that their cancer is metastatic. We already know by just, by just looking. And now our goal of surgery is to remove all visible disease. Um, and the reason we do that is because we know that if we go in at whether it's pre-chemotherapy or mid-chemotherapy, if we go in there and we remove the ovarian cancer to no gross residual disease, those patients will live the longest. They, we, we will have um, gained them a longer uh, remission, um, which is really our goal. We know that you know, very few are cured, uh, very few advanced stage ovarian cancers are cured. And so really our goal is um, get these patients into remission, which we have about an 80 to 85% chance of that with surgery and chemotherapy, um, but then keeping them in remission for as long as we can. And we do that when our surgery um, is able to remove uh, all visible disease. So hopefully that answered uh, answered the question. Any, uh, anything else? No. All right. Well, I'm seeing it's a few minutes after six. I'm sure you guys all have places to be. Um, again, thank you so much for coming up. Oh, oh, oh. More Ryan, you raised your hand. Hold on. Uh, where do I get Raised hands. Raise hand. No, I can raise my hand. Kelsey, help. I don't see I think... anyone with their hands. Oh, okay. Maybe she did it by mistake. It said more <laughs> Raya. Maybe she was trying to leave and she raised her hand by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. No worries. Um, again, thank you all for coming. Um, have a great night. Thank you. Have a good night, Leslie. Thank you, Kelsey.